On this episode of China Unscripted, China will do anything to beat the U.S., from exploiting social media to supporting conflict in the Middle East. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us once again is Professor M.D. Nalapat. He's the vice chair of the Manipal Advanced Research Group and the author of the new book, Cold War 2.0, Illusion versus Reality. Thank you for joining us once again. It's a pleasure. So, I mean, your new, your new book, I've, I've been hearing this idea a lot that there's, a, you know, a Cold War 2.0 going on. Um, when did this second Cold War start? Was there ever a gap between the first one and this one? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I'd like to say that the new Cold War essentially began when, it, the way I uh, frame it, when uh, essentially the, the Hong Kong handover took place. At that point in time, I do believe that people in the CCP were basically had more confidence in the belief that they could replace the United States as the world's preeminent power. How does that work? How do they make that jump from, all right, we got Hong Kong to we can beat the United States? Uh, I'm only saying that uh, the handover was a very big moment for the CCP uh, in the sense that, you know, something that was part of the colonial heritage was transferred and essentially Teng Xiaoping held his ground and ensured that while the Chinese, of course, set some limits to their behavior, there was absolutely no, there was no check, essentially, on what their behavior would be. It was basically a, a trust and belief system. So I think, uh, I mean, to two points of view. One is that they felt that the West was vulnerable uh, to this kind of concession and to major other concessions. And secondly, the Hong Kong handover, in a sense, symbolized the coming of age of the PRC uh, as a power which not just equal to the West, but it has taken back something which the West had. Uh, you know, in, in, in India, we like to believe that the fact that India got its independence acted as a kind of a spur to many other countries in Africa and in other parts of Asia to demand independence. And uh, as you probably know, India backed uh, uh, almost all these independence movements. So in the same way, I do believe that the conviction inside the CCP that finally the time had come for them to essentially you know, become the preeminent uh, uh, power on the globe. By, I mean, the, the PRC to become the preeminent power on the globe. I believe we can date it around 1997. And this is, I mean, you know, it is very easy to find a lot of studies with some clear metrics and, um, uh, you know, uh, ma mathematical equations, etc. But the reality is a lot of that is in a way subjective and how you look at the situation. And when you look at the way in which the CCP individuals that one was in contact with, the way they reacted after the handover, you could sense in them a feeling that, you know, if I can use US terminology, manifest destiny, our time has come, so to speak. You know, I always knew the mid 90s were the greatest period in human history. Before 1997. Before 1997, the Cold War was over, the second one had to start, little narrow golden age. Uh, well, so I have a question about the start of the Cold War 2.0, which is, so that's 26 years ago. Uh, how? Oh my like, God, did, did, really? I know, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel old. Uh, so did the CCP understand that they were starting the Cold War then? And did the West understand it then? Or did it take time for both sides to kind of figure out, oh, wait, we're in a Cold War? Look, I'd like to say that uh, if you look at the CCP doctrine, from the very beginning, you will see a doctrine that essentially says that the CCP has the answers uh, to at least the problems of the what we now call the global south, but what uh, Lin Biao called the villages of the world, as opposed to cities, which were the developed countries of the world. And the CCP, uh, from the very start, assumed that they had the wisdom and the leadership potential. And it's only a question of time before that leadership would get uh, actualized. So from that point of view, in my view, the CCP was involved in a, you know, basically it had a very opportunistic alliance with the Western world, specifically the United States, against the USSR, 
for the simple reason that right from the early 1950s, uh, Mao Zedong was chafing at the assumption made by the USSR that the USSR was a son, the fulcrum of the communist world, that the USSR was the leader of the communist world. And Mao was basically saying, hold on, that's basically us. It's not the USSR. So it took a while for, for the Americans to understand that up to the 1970s and Richard Nixon. But my own view is that you, after, you, after the Korean War, through, I would say, at least the mid-60s, the opportunity was there to basically come to an agreement with the PRC. So far, the USSR was concerned. And if you look at the polemics that were there between the PRC and uh, especially under Mao and uh, the USSR, you will understand the degree of, what, what could I say, the degree of distaste and disdain that certainly the PRC had for the communist model of the USSR. So from their point of view, the, they wanted to be the preeminent power. At that point in time, it was not certain that the, that the, you know, the US side would prevail in Cold War 1.0. I think that became certain only by the 1980s, by the time of Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, till that time, they were not certain. And they assumed that possibly the Soviet Union would be the preeminent power. It was certainly seen as the preeminent power in the communist world. And it had expanded throughout what we now call the global south, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the question is not really the United States or the USSR. It's simply which is the preeminent power, and so which is the power we have to take down. And to take down that power, we will do whatever is possible in our power, including teaming up with so-called ideological enemies and people whom, in the words of Mao Zedong, we have poured buckets of filth at you, on top of you on top of your reputation, and you have poured buckets of filth on top of us, but now let's get together, you know. So from that point of view, they basically embraced the U.S. as a way of tackling what they believe could be the preeminent power, and because they believed that the communist doctrine would finally prevail over other doctrines, they still believe that. And from that point of view, they, they came together with the U.S. Uh, in the old Cold War, and they were the biggest beneficiaries of that particular Cold War. More than Europe, more than the United States, more than any other country, it was communist China that was the biggest beneficiary of Cold War 1.0. Well, your book is also called Illusion versus Reality. Uh, so what, what, what is the illusion? What is the reality of this war? Look, the first point I'd like to make is that the CCP has been very good at camouflaging itself. Now, today you're seeing on television screens, for example, you had an unspeakable act of terror on the 7th of October against the State of Israel. Now, the State of Israel was founded, if I may be allowed a small diversion, because of the Holocaust, because of the unspeakable atrocities and the attempt to eliminate the Jewish community worldwide. If you look at the founding principles of Hamas, it is very clear, it is not simply Israel that needs to be ex uh, eliminated. I'm not going to use the word exterminated. They use the word eliminated. But the Jewish people as such are a people that basically need to be eliminated. You look at the founding principles, and a lot of them specifically mention the Jewish people. And, uh, and of course, many of them mention the state of Israel as well. So when you, you, know, when you look at it from... From, from that point of view, the reality is that when you have, a, you have a situation by which the PRC today has to had an alliance with the Islamists, with the Wahhabis, and I'd like to say, don't confuse the PRC with China. China is not the PRC. The Chinese people are not the communist Chinese. The lower level communist Chinese, the bottom uh, you know, 80% of them are not the other 20%. Of that 20%, the top 10% are not the same as the other 90%. So these are different populations entirely. So the, 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 C, the CCP has been very effective in basically making all of us identify China and the Chinese people with the CCP and more specifically the CCP leadership. The CCP leadership has been very focused 
on being the preeminent power. And as I said, at that point in time, 1997, they had the feeling that now our time has come. And the good news is that under Xi Jinping, they have a leader who's abandoned all pretense of that particular realization. Before Xi Jinping, you had Hu Jintao, you had Jiang Zemin, you had Deng Xiaoping, and they were acting as the good cop. But in their minds, there was always the desire to be the preeminent power. For example, their transformation of, of, you know, of industry in China in terms of high tech began during Hu Jintao's period. Uh, uh, Hu Jintao, I'm told, he, you know, he went to a, 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 a modern building, he had an escalator, a watch, a brisk, a brisk, almost everything he saw around him was made by other countries. And he says, hold on, why can't we make them? Why just we just making parts? And they began a kind of transformation of China into a power that finally hollowed out manufacturing in a large part of the world. So if I may say so, the illusion is that first, that communist China, specifically the communist leadership, is China and the Chinese people. That's not true. And second, that you can come to terms with uh, communist China. And, you know, uh, and because the fact is, it is an existential conflict. And for an existential conflict means one or the other system will prevail. Either the, the, the system dominated by China and by Chinese characteristics will prevail. By China, I'm now using shorthand for the PRC. Or the system led by the United States, I'm not going to say dominated by the United States, and the system of the United States will prevail. One of the two systems will prevail. It's as existential as Cold War 1.0 was. And the illusion is that it was. it is not existential. The reality is it is existential. And that is what I mean by illusion versus reality. Let's have no illusions that we are in a new Cold War as existential as the old Cold War seemed to be in the 60s and 70s. You know, I yeah. think that's a really important point to make because I see a lot of uh, discourse about China now where people are like, well, the problem is Xi Jinping. Things were great under Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, but you're making the point that, you know, they they always had this plan that Xi Jinping is fulfilling. They just hadn't gotten there yet. And so, yeah, it is an existential battle. It's not that, hey, the CCP was fine before Xi Jinping. If we just get rid of Xi Jinping, things will be great. Well, you're absolutely right. The good thing about Xi Jinping is that he's very transparent about it. Now, look at what's happening uh, in the South China Sea. You know, actually, it should be called the ASEAN Sea, but forget it. Uh, but the reality is that it's become a, P a PLA lake. The South China Sea with all these artificial islands, with all these PLA outposts, it's become like a PLA lake. And that happened, that began actually during the era of Jiang Zemin and was speeded up by Hu Jintao and was revealed to the world, frankly, by Xi Jinping. So Xi Jinping is not basically the, you know, the architect of Cold War 2.0. He is the most visible manifestation of the reality of Cold War 2.0, what he's doing in South China Sea, what he tried to do in the Himalayan Massive, what he's doing in Taiwan. Now, we are talking about sovereignty here, and we are talking about Taiwanese sea sovereignty, sea space, air space, and threats to land space. And that is being severely impacted and severely reduced by the, by the PLA. So he's being very overt about it with the result that those who believe that you can live amicably with China, there were many people who believed that you could live amicably with the Soviets while they went about their business and the rest of the world went about theirs. But you have a lot of large number of people even today who believe you can live amicably with the PRC and we can, and in fact, you had individuals who thought of a G2. Uh, India, I mean, you know, uh, has been uh, chafing at the bit when we heard about the G2 way back in the Obama years, about China and the U.S. basically splitting the world between them. The fact is that the CCP doctrine is very clear. It's going to be us all the way. And uh, possibly, if you look at American history, the Monroe Doctrine, I mean, all down, up and down that particular you know, side of the place, it's the U.S. all the way. So China has now expanded the Monroe Doctrine in, into the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is now the theater of operations, and the Eurasian landmass 
is a theater of operations of the Chinese Monroe, Monroe Doctrine, which basically means we are the preeminent and dominant power here, and other powers who want to interfere better watch out. So you're, you're saying, you know, Xi Jinping is more open about the CCP's plans than Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin. Uh, but it's waking people up and seeing what the CCP is doing. So is Xi Jinping being stupid or is this something strategic where he's intentionally making it clearer and clearer uh, what the CCP wants to do? Well, one of the problems with the CCP leadership, it's dominated by engineers. It's dominated by, by data, uh, recorded data. It's dominated by mathematical programming. And you lose touch of the human factor. Now, in Kalwan, for example, the mathematical programming showed that the Chinese military was overwhelmingly more powerful than the Indian side. Now, of course, we have developed many more uh, uh, units and equipment and other things have moved to that particular area. At that point in time, uh, mathematically, you could argue that the PLA was superior. And then what happened? You had PLA uh, recruits coming in and confronting Indian soldiers. Indian soldiers are what Mao soldiers were. They are peasant soldiers. They come from families that in which there have been deaths as a result of starvation, as a result of disease. They have known hardship. And very importantly, from the beginning of his or her enlistment under this government of Prime Minister Modi, women are also now freely allowed to enlist in the military. And that's excellent. They have faced hostile fire. Now, so far as the PLA is concerned, the last time they faced hostile fire was some, I think, 1979 in Vietnam. Their idea of war was video gaming, frankly, or war gaming. And a war game can be look very realistic in a, you know, in a video or even in a mock demonstration. But it's not really realistic because that inner terror is not there. The fact that you you could be your life could be cut short is not there. As someone who has gone uh, a few times, may I say, into into the zones where the fire has been exchanged, whether it's in Kashmir whether it's in some other parts of the world, including in Syria. Well, let me say there's a big difference when you are actually in a situation of free. Whereas in the Chinese case, you have single children, single male children who have been recruited to the PLA and their parents and grandparents don't want anything to happen to their darling you know, children, their darling male children. And very frankly, the darling male children who have been spoiled all their lives they don't want anything to happen to them. So essentially, the kind of soldiers that we have, when the PLA used the, you know, they, if you remember, there was a confidence building mechanism in which bullets would not be used. Uh, arms would not, you know, normal weapons, that is, you know, guns and ammunition would not be used. On the Indian border, correct? On the Indian and China border. Uh, I'm not going to say who recommended that particular CBM. But if you look through the records, you might find the person who recommended that CBM at that point in time. That person was a little more, if I may say so, you know, a, a little more trusting that eventually you could have an accommodation with uh, between China and India. But the point is that when they came with their clubs in which there were uh, stone, there was there were you know uh, iron spikes. They came with various other weapons, and they attacked the Indian soldiers. And the Indian soldiers, of course, fortunately, had bayonets uh, in their uniforms. So they quickly took out, they didn't have bullets. They took out the bayonets. And then by our count, by our satellite count, it was confirmed by the Russians. And then quickly, they remained silent. About 60 Chinese soldiers died for 20 of our soldiers. Now, what the Chinese soldiers did was make, in my view, either uh, accidentally or deliberately a mistake. The commanding officer was pushed off a crevice uh, in a mountain, and he died. He fell down and he died. Now, the Indian soldiers trained. When your CO is killed by the enemy, you just go crazy against the enemy. You don't worry about yourself. You don't worry about your life. You don't worry about anything. You just finish off these XYZ people who have finished off our CO. And that's exactly what the Indian military did. And that's why about 60 Chinese paid with their lives. After Galwan, you find that, uh, you know, uh, basically the Chinese keep refreshing their troops 
on the India border. And they are a lot more respectful of, if I may say so, military assaults on that border than they were in the past. So the human factor, the Indian military are people who are like Mao's military. The Chinese military are single children, single male children, whose only war they've seen is in comic books, movies, and ex field exercises without any active hostile fire. So that uh, Mr. Xi Jinping and his engineering talent did not take into account. So I'd like to say that the, C that the point, the problem with the CCP, they don't take the, the human factor into account. And by the human factor, for example, in Taiwan, you've got amazing human talent in Taiwan. And that's why Taiwan is a technological power, which in per capita terms is way ahead uh, of the PRC. And it's very ironic that it's Taiwan, US and Japan, the three countries that are now the primary targets with India of the, of the, of the PRC that, are, that have helped the PRC be what it is. But what I'm saying is that the human factor is very, very important. We saw that in Ukraine. Where, you know, I mean, frankly, I, I have been uh, a skeptic about the Ukrainian success in this war. I honestly believe from the start, I think I've been in one of your shows and I did express that the better the Ukrainians accept the loss of some territory than kill themselves trying to regain territory from a force that is plainly going to grind them to bits. But the Russian side underestimated the human factor and underestimated Ukrainian resistance, just as Hamas today has underestimated Jewish and Israeli resistance. The fact of the matter is, Hamas believed that about 200 odd hostages, plus the horrible things that they did, would ensure, and of course, all the videos that they're streaming, and there's a tremendous disinformation campaign that must have been planned for months and months. This particular campaign would have taken at least six to eight months to plan. And unfortunately, Netanyahu gave them the excuse by having some individuals in the Jewish fringe march all across the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was, uh, I mean, a huge strategic error, a huge psychological and tactical error. And that gave Hamas the excuse to launch its plan, uh, believing that the Muslim world will be behind it. Now, I know this is not going to be popular, just as my Ukraine thing was not popular in the last session, but I frankly don't believe the Iranians have any stomach to get into this. I frankly don't believe Hezbollah has any stomach to get into this. And I am praying that it remains confined to Hamas and the IDF. And I'm praying that, you know, uh, I mean, that by no means is a situation created in which is assumed that Iran is interfering when I don't think it is. Hezbollah is playing an active role when I don't think it is. So far, uh, there have been only, what am I say, you know, what we call Nam Ke Vaste, namesake uh, activities on that particular border. I'd like to keep it that way while the problem of Hamas is dealt with. And I firmly believe that in this war, the IDF will prevail. Why? Because the Jewish people have been through an attempted Holocaust before. They know what it is and they're not going to allow this to happen a second time around. It's never going to happen, I can tell you. And that is where the human factor has not been taken into account by Hamas. So even if the whole world, even if the United States tells them stop, 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 the IDF is not going to stop until it has finally taken care of the problem that is caused by an organization of terrorists that has explicitly been responded, 85, if I'm not mistaken, explicitly implied that the Jewish people do not have a right to exist. You remember, in the 20th century, there was an organization that believed the same thing. And now you have Hamas explicitly saying that. And your apologists for Hamas appearing. I mean, in Canada, for example, there are more pro-Hamas marches in Canada than in the Gaza Strip, in Australia, in the United States, in the United Kingdom. I mean, what is happening? This is the kind of illusion that you have about what I call the Sino-Wahhabi alliance. And this is why from a long time I've been saying the Wahhabis and the Sino, by, by which Sino, I don't mean the Chinese people, I mean the CCP leadership. That particular alliance, I mean, is really, you know, uh, is really uh, underestimating 
the resilience of certain people and definitely i think the resilience of the jewish people and the resilience of state of israel no matter what the mistakes israel made in the past whatever the resilience of that people cannot be underestimated and it's my view that the idf will break the back of hamas in this operation because they know if they don't once again hamas is going to come after them and worse then other organizations are going to become what hamas uh, uh, has become because they are incentivized by the failure of the idf to break the back of hamas just as india went in and liberated bangladesh from genocide in 1971 when kissinger was asking the us and china they were begging the chinese to send their troops and sending the seventh fleet into india we went ahead i mean into indian ocean we went ahead and liberated bangladesh the israelis will go ahead and liberate the people of gaza because tell the people of gaza are the real hostages they are being held hostage the palestinian people you look at them anywhere in the world they are very very they are they're brilliant they are they are very very good they can be tremendous contributors to the globe but they are not being allowed to do so in gaza by the hamas they are going to be liberated in 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 by you know in gaza i am very very certain the idf will do that liberation this if no matter what the pressure so what i'm trying to say is the good news is that the, they have underestimated the human factor and the human factor the pull of democracy the pull of freedom the pull of seeing a multicultural society you know, you've seen in china an effort is made to basically you know uh, convert into i wouldn't even say hanize uh, because it's different from the the chinese have evolved a culture entirely different in many respects from the traditional han culture but make everybody that same culture whether uighur or the tibetan whether manchurian or the mongolian everybody will be that culture and yet you have in countries in the world a very multicultural situ- situation india has about 200 million muslims and we are happy and proud about them so that example gives an inner strength to the population that i think has not been factored in by the sino wahhabi alliance well i want to get to something you you touched upon cuz this is in your book and you talk about how like there's different um societies or different government leaderships in history that have been racist in different ways uh you argue that the ccp is racist but racist in a more advanced way than the nazis were racist could you uh explain that a little bit well i'd like to say that i don't believe that the han description is a completely dna based ethno based description it's more of an assimilation and a culture now i know for example families in china where you know you have ladies for example who are married indian men and who have settled in china and who are living happily in china and have produced children and the children are completely i mean sinicized in the communist way they're very happy in china and they regard themselves as totally chinese now of course the in the indian fathers also they become admirers of uh, of you know of the chinese people the well, chinese are a wonderful people so frankly the germans had this ridiculous notion of ethnicity that you had and that is the same notion that the british used to partition india that the muslims and indians were two different nations two different ethnicities two different dnas which is absurd now you look at for example ashkenazi jews uh, i mean you know where is uh, if you look at the difference the dna difference there is really in nothing except from the pseudo laboratories of the nazis and pseudo experiments by mengele and himmler and people like that so they had a very narrow ethno based uh, you know uh, situation and if i may say so they were taught their lesson and i would refer you to some of the speeches made by joseph stalin because when the soviet union started prevailing by 1943 in world war 2 he started mocking the germans oh these are the superior people these are the you know the ubermensch they use some russian word for that and we are the untermensch the lower lesser breed he used some russian word for that very sarcastically and look where they are hundreds of thousands of them surrendering what has happened to these superior people 
what has happened to them in the hands of these inferior people? And he, I mean, there are several speeches of Stalin in which he has basically praised the Russian spirit. And, and the Germans regard the Russians as subhuman. And they could, they could slice through Russia. Thanks to Stalin's strategic mistakes, especially his culling of the generals. All the good generals were culled because of a German uh, you know, uh, conspiracy to, uh, to make Stalin believe that the best generals were basically German agents when they were the best fighters against Germany. By 1942, Stalin realized his mistake. By middle of 1942, he got all the generals who were still alive in prison camps back, put them into work, and the Germans started uh, losing ground after that. But what I want to say is that they're not racist in the traditional Western sense of racism. For example, you got white racism, let's say. You know, that people say that just because, you know, you come from a, uh, you know, uh, you're less pigmentation, uh, you are of a different breed than people who have more pigmentation, let's put it that way. And I'd like to say that my experience in the United States, frankly, even in, back in the, you know, in the days when there was supposed to be racism, I mean, early 90s or even earlier, in the South, for example, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, once they understood that you spoke a little bit of English, once they understood that you knew a little bit, you know, possibly a bit more than they on some other matters, I can assure you their behavior changed very significantly. And the Indian community in the United States, you look at the Indian community in terms of, of uh, you know, of skin color. I mean, I would say in many respects, I mean, on average, possibly uh, even darker than some other communities in the United States. But the Indian community today is, in per capita terms, bigger in terms of, you know, uh, per capita income than the uh, than the even the Jewish communities, the Japanese American communities. Forget the other Caucasian communities. So, frankly, uh, I don't think, you know, I mean, frankly, that there are certain some white races in the United States, but it's not as serious a problem as people make it out to be. And where this is very important now. You go back to my writing. I think in 2020, you will say that how I have said about how the internet space is being intruded into by the CCP in America and India in particular to widen the, the fringes. You have the white fringes, the anti-white fringes, the Hindu fringe, the anti-Hindu fringe, and shrink the moderate middle. And the same thing is happening in the United States. And what you're seeing now is a kind of a, the fringes tearing at each other and trying to grow and trying to expand at the expense of the moderate middle in these two societies. And you're looking at, at you know, at internet silos. And, you know, we all have a habit of going to silos that we like and getting more and more convinced that we are in the right. If you're a, you know, if you believe that America is a land of white races, you go into that silo, you get more belief. If you believe America is a land of opportunity, you go into that silo, you believe that. This is, the CCP is active in doing this. And I don't believe any of the internet platforms, frankly, are aware of this problem. I don't believe any of the internet platforms are dealing with this problem sufficiently. And that's why you have this tremendous penetration of the internet space and the social media conversation space by entities that essentially objectively support a CCP agenda of division in the democracies. So first the idea is weaken from within before you attack from without. And the internet space is being very intelligently used by CCP actors for that in a way which I do not believe. In India, we got it. Prime Minister Modi got it. He banned TikTok. I mean, is it banned in the United States? No. Now India has passed a law banning, uh, I mean, basically putting under the screen, which basically means the approval is never going to come. I mean, technically it's not banned, so you can't be WTO, you know, non-compliant, but it has to go through security appraisal, which may take its own time to come. Telecom, energy, all these key systems. Uh, uh, India is saying no under Prime Minister Modi. It's not happening in the United States. It's not happening in Europe. And this is the point. Now, in, this is why I, I told you before, Hamas rallies in favor of Hamas across the Western world. More rallies than in Gaza. 
uh, social media conversation that portray the Jewish people as the criminals, as the as the you know as the as the basically not the victims of terrorism, but as the terrorists almost. I am read. I am going through social media conversation in the Western world. I have asked my research team to scroll through that, and they have come up with some pretty scary findings about the, how the social media conversation is so lopsided against Israel's right of self-defense against an existential threat from Hamas. You know, I, I gotta I gotta interrupt there because I've kind of noticed this. Um, like, there's there's a bunch of like pro-Hamas accounts that will be like you know, messaging me. And like, if I look at these accounts, they're like new accounts that only have like one or two posts. And this is something I used to know is from pro CCP accounts. And so you have mentioned that uh, the CCP will sort of use anything to beat whatever it considers its main opponent, like how it teamed up with the U.S. against the Soviet Union. Do you think the CCP is now using the conflict in the Middle East for its own purposes of toppling the U.S.? I would only like to say that everybody in the U.S. is talking about Iran. Guess which superpower was fully backing Iran, number one. Of course, I don't believe the Iranians want to get involved in this conflict. I don't believe that. But a different matter. But Iran is now what I would call the lizard's tail. Everybody, the cat is chasing after the lizard's tail. And the lizard, which is the CCP, is escaping. The fact is that, you know, if you look at social media, the kind of development of Wahhabism, the kind of anti-Jewish feeling, the kind of anti-Israel feeling, the kind of you know feeling against Hindus, against Jews, and against Christians, if I may say so, and against moderate Muslims that is being spread all over. Uh, if you look at that, it's very clear who's benefiting from this. That's why in the Ukraine war, I said from the beginning, the CCP wants this war to go on and on and on and on. And they would like this war to go on and on and on and on. And they would like other wars to go on and on and on and on. Because Uncle Xi needs a fourth term if he is to survive, I mean, in politics or whatever else. And by the time his third term comes to an end, he needs a military victory. On, on, in Indi on the Indian side, the Indian soldier, frankly, is proved to be a bit of a problem for the PLA. The PLA boys are just not up to the Indian soldier. And you have Prime Minister Modi, who, by the way, all these CCP accounts, Wahhabi accounts, etc., there's a coordinated campaign to portray Modi as some kind of a, you know, anti-democratic, uh, dictatorial force. I mean, for God's sake, and a lot of these are Pakistani websites. In Pakistan, the minority community is below 2%. It was nearly 40% in partition. In India, the Muslim community was about 35, 36 million. Raised 200 million. And we're talking about Muslim genocide in India? I mean, give me a break. The Western world is talking about Muslim genocide in India. The Western world is saying you're discriminating against Muslim because you're suggesting a law that everybody should have only one wife. How many people, citizens of the United States, no matter what your religion, are allowed to have more than one wife? I mean, I know you have some situation in Utah with the Mormons. <laughs> that's, that's not technically legal. The, right. I mean, they're, those are with sister wives, so they're not like legally wives. But, well, uh, but that's, yeah, I mean, it's generally frowned on in the United States. Well, I would say it's illegal in the United States. and if, uh, But when we say it's illegal and we want to make it illegal, and they, oh my God, you're being against your different community. You're being anti-Muslim, for God's sake. You know, my, I mean, that is ridiculous. The Muslim well, hey, to be fair, I have heard people argue in the United States that promoting monogamy is white supremacy. <laughs> well, uh, I'm monogamous, I can tell you. And I, I, mean, I think I'm that's the first time I made you speechless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's difficult to make an Indian speechless, especially from my home state of Kerala. We speak very, very fast and we speak a lot. <laughs> um. Well, so this, this is the question that I always have. Uh, how do you beat communism? It seems like it's such an insidious thing, not just not just the CC, CCP, but this ideology. It's so pervasive and so corrosive. It seems, how do you how do you beat it? Right. I mean, you've got communist ideas in India. They've been in Indian politics for, for generations. Uh, they've been in 
uh, in the Middle East and, and some of those groups uh, like Hamas, there's some communist ideas, right? So it's kind of... The whole defense of Hamas in the U.S. too, like the idea that like, oh, well, you know, the is, Israelis are the oppressors, so anything Hamas does is justified. That's very much a Marxist oppressor. Versus, like anything the oppressed do to the oppressors is justified. Yeah. So like, how, how do you beat this? Look... First of all, I'd like to say you beat it by fair treatment of everybody. India is still the chairman of the G20. And Prime Minister Modi's motto is Vasudeva Kutumbakam. The world is one family, one earth, one future. And one, and that is the, the message. We are seeing, unfortunately, from the 1980s onwards, uh, in, I would say from the 1970s onwards, Growing inequality in some parts of the world. We are seeing a larger and larger proportion of the national wealth being held by a smaller and smaller number of people. And that, I think, is a problem area. You cannot have a sy system in which there is growing inequality. You have to have a system in which the middle class expands. The lower class contracts and the middle class grows. Then the middle class grows into the, into the upper class. Today, you have a system by which middle class is migrating to the lower class. And the upper class may be improving a little bit, but not by enough. And the hold they have on resources is incredible. I mean, many of these individuals who are promoting a woke ideology, they're worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. So it's wonderful. I, I wish that they would give away their billions first before embracing a woke ideology. But I'd like to say that increasing inequality in the capitalist system is becoming a great argument for what is now defined as communism. And what is defined as communism is naked authoritarianism. Com the communist machine is the leader knows best and the leader knows all. And you should follow. I mean, you know, it's like, it's a military kind of thing. The field marshal tells you do this, down the line, you do it. No questions asked. But of course, up the line, obviously, they'll be in the, in the communist system. This is the de facto communist system. So I think it's important for us to distinguish, like to distinguish between the Chinese people and the top ranks of the CCP and the Communist Party, if I may say so. You have to distinguish between communism as taught by Marx and Engels, where you say, from each according to his ability or her ability, and to each according to his own need. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said. The world is enough for human need. The world doesn't have enough for human greed. It's very similar to what Gandhi said. But if you look at the communist world, it's very different from the Gandhian world. So I think the first thing is basically to understand what is the objective reality of communist practice. Forget communist theory. We have scholars who have studied Decades of communist theory. Marx, Engels, Mao, Stalin, Lin Biao, uh, even Xi Jinping. Forget all that. What they're writing and what they're practicing are different. We have to expose what they practice. Now, in the case of social media, for example, you know, uh, what Hamas has been practicing. There would be so many stories out there. And as and when more areas get liberated, hopefully these stories will come out. But they've hardly ever come out. Gaza has been a black hole of information. So far as Hamas is concerned, nobody knows what they're doing in Hamas. Only when those Israeli babies were butchered and Israeli, that's happened to the people in Hamas who are against, I mean in Gaza, who are against Hamas. It is a black hole. So I think first, you have to ensure that there is a situation by which the lower classes seep into the middle class and the middle class seep into the upper class. And the upper class doesn't have a disproportionate share of, of resources globally and in terms of a country. And I would say, for example, the top 10%, if they have more than one third of the resources of a country, there's something wrong with the, with the capitalism practiced in that country. And if the bottom 50% have less than, let us say, let's put it at one third, one third of the total resources, the bottom 50%, there's something wrong with that particular 
uh, form of capitalism. Well, how do you solve for that problem? Because some people would say, oh, well, we need wealth redistribution. And that's what they did in communist China. The problem is that when people, the people in charge of seizing all the wealth are in charge, they end up keeping all the wealth and the dis- the right. wealth gap becomes even bigger. Well, there's no way to have a government redistribute wealth without giving that government enormous power over people. And money, yeah. So essentially, government-led wealth redistribution is authoritarianism. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think, you know, I've been mistaken completely. I'm talking about within the capitalist system. Today, for example, you have some, you know, let's say you become a, a, a multi-billionaire in the techno world. You spend a lot of time preventing the other, uh, you know, uh, other competitors from coming. You spend a lot of time preventing startups from coming up. In India, for example, in the past, we saw multiple startups that were extinguished because the huge competitors, many external, they basically reached out to uh, corrupt officials or they reached out to the judicial system or various other ways and they forced the startup Uh, geniuses to either give the technology to them for a song or basically be driven out of business or they have to migrate to the United States or other places to do their startups. So I'm saying, do you think capitalism is free now in the sense that, you know, you are are allowing young people of talent, you know, the banking system, for example, you have such a premium on writing off loans. You have such a premium on those who have money getting more money. And where is the premium for a good idea? Where is the premium for a good intention? Where is the premium for for genius? And that premium has to come back into capitalism. Facebook started, you know, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. They started with people who had possibly less savings than all of us put together, much less. And look where they are today. But look where they are today. Uh, You know, competitors, I mean, by one means or the other, Startups, a lot of startups, are just not coming up. So this is what I'm saying. I'm. Let me say one thing very clearly: snuffing out competition is not capitalism. A free competition is fair competition, and I am arguing for free, fair, and transparent competition. And if you're seeing that in the world, if you're seeing efforts at creating monopolies not not there, if you're seeing efforts at that perpetuating monopolies, not there. If you're seeing efforts of snuffing out, snuffing out startups, not there. We must have a startup ecosystem where talent is there. Don't forget the Middle East, Gaza. 50% of Gaza is below the age of 16. Yesterday, I was on a program where I had an Omani uh, you know, interlocutor, and I told the Omani, the young Indians and the young people in the Middle East must come together. And I include the the Jewish people in that, to ensure that we start up and we produce technology that can wave wind, wave solar. Today, if you dig deep enough, you'll find that existing people, if such technologies are starting up, we have to find the government must locate them. Private individuals must locate them. Find out where they are. Find out the geniuses behind them. Give them the money they need. That is capitalism. You have to grow a new Facebook, a new Google, and a new Microsoft. Why hasn't that happened for the last 30 years? I mean, uh, Professor Nalabat, like to bring this back to the kind of, you're talking about the Cold War 2.0 is the systems conflict between the CCP system and the U.S. You know, the Cold War One being a systems conflict between the USSR and the U.S., are there lessons we can learn from that? Or are there too many differences between the two Cold Wars? Uh, Frankly, are the Russian people different from the Chinese people? Yes. Is the CCP different from the CPSU? Yes. Is today's situation different from that of, say, 75, 80 years ago? Yes. Absolutely. It's a new Cold War. It's an entirely new ball game. It's no longer soccer. It's baseball. Let's put it that way. There's no question about that. So I think from that point of view, Cold War 2.0 is very different from Cold War 1.0. And that is where, for example, in my case, I was very heartened by, I mean, I'm not sure if this will be welcomed here, but Vivek Ramaswamy and Donald Trump saying that they would try to get Russia on the side of the West against China. 
I don't think the Russian people are very happy to be what they are today, which is the serfs and helots of the CCP. They are functioning, and the, I mean, the, in India, our relationship with Russia is okay. I don't think the Russian, you know, the, I don't think the Sino Russian lobby is active in India. It's active in the United States, it's active in Europe, uh, but it's not active in India. But the Sino Wahhabi lobby is active in India, the Sino lobby is active in India. But I would say it makes perfect sense to try and ensure that the Russians come over to the side of the democracies, like Vietnam should come over to the side of the democracies. And from that point of view, we have to think strategically. If Roosevelt could make up with Joe Stalin, certainly you can make up, you know, uh, in, with Russia and the US can make up. And I'm heartened that American politicians are thinking that because the simple fact is we have so much to look. Capitalism, I mean, I'm talking of Microsoft, Google, et cetera, et cetera, but with all that, it's a way better system than the authoritarian system. The problem with the authoritarian system, once the person at the top decides this is the right line to follow, everything else gets snuffed out. In a capitalist system, you have little candles everywhere, and some of those candles grow and multiply. So you always got hope. In the authoritarian system, there's no hope, unless you have a super genius as the leader, which I think is humanly uh, very, very, it's, it's impossible, let's put it that way. So from that point of view, yes, your, my answer is it's a very different Cold War. And unfortunately, a lot of the people in the Eastern establishment, I classify, you know, Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan among them, are still living in the Cold War 1.0, where Russia was the big bad wolf and China was the opportunity. They are still in that romantic afterglow. They are still in that illusion. But the reality is, it's no longer Russia. It's China. It's no longer the Atlantic. It's the Indo-Pacific. It's no longer Europe. It's Asia. I think if you look at the GDP figures, the total GDP in Asia, total GDP in Europe, total trade in Asia, total trade in Europe, with the United States as well, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, people are still living in the romantic romanticism that we are still in Cold War 1.0. And I was horrified by the reaction to the Ukraine war because it shows the extent of that romanticism. And, let, and this is very much to the playbook of the CCP. The CCP wants this conflict with Russia and the, and the West to go on. That's why I wrote long back, this is going to go on and on and on and on, because that's what they want. And the West is telling the Ukrainians, you know, I mean, don't accept the inevitable, fight back. And the Ukrainians are suffering and paying with their lives for that. And, you know, and, and that's what's happening. So I'd like to say very clearly that this is Cold War 2.0. It's the, in, and may I say Canada, for example, under Justin Trudeau, who basically uh, has welcomed more Hamas people, I mean, into Canada than possibly you have Hamas recruits in Gaza in the last eight years. And if you look at the manifestations of that in social media in Canada, in street rallies, you may... You may get some idea of what I'm saying, in a, maybe in a somewhat, you know, a slightly uh, in a different form. But what I want to say very clearly is that in this situation, we have to think strategically, not just tactically. And in this situation, we have to be very clear who our friends are, who our potential friends are, and what is the main threat, the main enemy. Just as the world combined in the Second World War, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill combined against the main enemy, Adolf Hitler, and Hideki Tojo after that, of course, but Tojo was small fry compared to Hitler. We need to combine against the main enemy, which is the top rung of the CCP and his delusional belief that it can supplant, you know, the I mean, the United States and other countries and be the center of power. Because if they become the center of power, they will rule in an absolutist manner. And that is something, you know, they're doing that, for example, with the ethnic Chinese communities in Malaysia, in Singapore, in, in Vietnam, you know, in Thailand. They're trying to say that, you know, you should support the CCP. You should support us because we're fighting your fight. They're not even fighting the fight of the ordinary Chinese people. 
How were they fighting the fight of overseas Chinese? We were a wonderful, glorious community who have done amazing things all across this world. But the CCP is telling them, if you've got relatives in China and you become, quote unquote, a traitor to China, which means don't do what the CCP wants you to do, well, don't blame us if something bad happens to your relatives. All that's going on in plain sight. How many people are reporting it besides China and censored? I don't know. I mean, I guess you say in your book that we are essentially kind of in 1937, uh, the equivalent of 1937. When Hitler invaded, before Hitler, Hitler invaded, invaded Poland. Poland. So World War II. Um, how do we prevent ourselves from getting to 1939? Is this what you're saying? First of all, I'd like to say that arms and ammunition and the terms on which you're giving to Ukraine, you're not giving a 20th of that to Taiwan. You're not giving a 20th of that to India. Taiwan and India are paying top dollar for U.S. arms. You're not uh, offering THAAD uh, free of cost because it will benefit U.S. security to India. There were some informal uh, period feelers for THAAD when some of us were actively working against India buying the Russian uh, S-400 system. It turned out I was right. I said, watch out. And when, if a real wartime situation comes, we're going to find it difficult. I said, buy all the oil you can from Russia, but don't buy their defense. But they said, where's the alternative? There's no alternative. The Americans are simply not ready to give us THAD unless we become full-fledged military allies, which basically mean do what the Americans want us to do. And when that means support the Ukraine war against Russia, which you're not going to do. You know, it's like saying support the Vietnamese war uh, against the Vietnamese. We didn't do that. We're not going to do that. So that is the, that is the point, you know, that uh, I'd like to say. We have to build an alliance system. Like the alliance system in the Second World War came very late. It came in 1941 after so much of bloodshed and so much of conquest. Please, this time around, let's make it come at least in nine, te technically in 1939, but there the Russians were not in because of the fact that the British and the French refused essentially Stalin's repeated offers of a partnership against Hitler. He turned to Hitler. So there was only Britain, France, and a very pacifist United States, by the way, at that point in time, only Britain and France against Hitler. Don't make that mistake now, please. Any country that is challenged, come together, form an alliance. Let's have 1941 in 1937. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Once again, the book is Cold War 2.0, Illusion versus Reality. We'll put a link below. Uh, where can anyone watching uh, want to uh, follow you? Thank you. Bless you. God bless uh, all of us. God bless democracy. God bless all of us. God bless the Chinese people. God bless the Indian people. God bless the American people. Because people, I can tell you, are different from authoritarian systems in a way that they are not so entirely different in capitalist systems. Thank you. I think it's going to be very hard to build a global alliance against China because there's so much in the elite circles in Western countries that just don't want there to be conflict with China. And so as part of that conflict avoidance, whether it's for business interests or, or ideological reasons, as part of that conflict avoidance, they don't want to create alliances ahead of time because that would anger the CCP. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Like this is the big challenge in beating communism that we have like this group of elite that is supporting the Chinese Communist Party. I guess I guess what we need to do is like have some kind of uprising of the people to overthrow the elite who rule over us and oppress us. And that's how we beat communism. Great idea, Chris. And who will lead this uprising of the oppressed? Well, I'm not <laughs> doing anything right now after this podcast, so I volunteer myself. Uh, Chris Chappell for a supreme leader. For life. Actually, that reminds me, I saw something on Twitter where this uh, former teacher was talking about a social experiment he did in his classroom where he uh -huh. basically gave students extra credit tickets 
based on how early they got to class. So the earlier you got there, the more tickets you had. So then the people at the end had almost no tickets. And so he then he didn't do anything for the whole class and kind of let the classroom figure it out for themselves. And there was a girl who managed to, to through her charm and charisma, convince the people who came later who didn't have enough tickets to, like, vote to take the tickets away from the people who came earlier, and then she would redistribute them, uh -huh. like, fairly among the people. And then so they managed to get the tickets away from the minority group who had n not enough power to uh -huh. vote against it. Then she took all the tickets, and then she kept most of the tickets and became, like, supreme leader. Now, wow, did that's the brilliant. parents sign off on this social experiment I that mean, the teacher just decided to do? It, it was like a 40-minute classroom period. They're not taking over the world yet. No. Yet. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's kind of horrifying that it's just there in the hearts of all. High school students? Yeah, particularly. It was led by a woman. Let that be a lesson to you. Watch out for those women. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is an interesting lesson that it is in... There are things in the human heart that are that can go this direction, right? If if circumstances permit, and so the way that, like for example, the U.S. Constitution is designed is to basically slow down everything by distributing power among branches and having checks and balances so that it doesn't happen, and we have a much less uh, efficient government, right? I mean, look at Congress is always arguing, right? But but we're also way less authoritarian than probably 80, 90% of countries. To be fair, most countries are pretty authoritarian. Well, certainly the majority are absolutely authoritarian, more than 50%. But but even among the other 50%, there's, there's a gradation, right, of, of authoritarianism. And the U.S. for all of its problems and all of its congressional ineptitude and budget crises and so on, it's, it's not as authoritarian even as like uh, Canada. Very true. Um, yeah, some, something I thought of during this that was, was interesting is like, you know, there was this idea of like, you know, the nation states or, you know, ethno states. Um, but really the more traditional way that humans have arranged themselves is sort of in tribal arrangements. And... Uh, you know, tribes, you're part of a tribe not based on an ethnicity. People in the past didn't have any idea of like, you know, genetics like that. You were part of a tribe if you followed these same beliefs. And that's kind of what uh, Professor Nalapat was saying, that the, the, the world is, again, dividing into these tribal sides. It's like, do you uh, adhere to the rituals and beliefs of democracy and freedom, or do you adhere to this other system being led by China? It's still that um, communist authoritarianism. And it's I, challenging because, oh, go ahead. No, I was just stunned because the entire time I was waiting for the punchline, but you actually had a serious point and I was taken aback. I, I was watching you <laughs> thinking that. Yes. I, I, to be fair, I also thought that you were going to spin this into why you should be elected supreme leader. I mean, those, life. the facts speak for themselves. But I was going to say, <laughs> it's true. Uh, the It's unfortunately more complex than just these two tribes, right? Because- like India is in so many ways its own tribe. Uh, Russia is in so many ways its own tribe, right? Like the, everyone's kind of got really different things going on. And like, you know, you want to build an alliance against the CCP, but like the question, for example, to try to include Russia, like how much concessions would the US have to make to get Russia on board with that? Uh, how much co concessions, ideological or or otherwise, would we have to make to get Iran uh, to, to uh, side with I us? Think I, think, uh, I think you're uh, talking about like the other side. <laughs> like, like right. you don't, let's not worry about Iran yet. Like you're kind of like, how do we get, you know. Well, let's get Blinken on our <laughs> side. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a place to start. I was going to say Malaysia, but good point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. But I mean, I think for Russia, it's going to be pretty hard as long as Putin and Xi are BFFs. So yeah. it's, yeah. Right. But I mean, it puts India in a tough position, right? Because India is a sort of, you know, has a lot of trade with Russia and good relations with Russia, but also with the West. And they've, they're, they're, they haven't they have picked one or the other. Although I think Nalapat's argument, and, and, you know, I may be wrong about this, is that the, what India ought to do is move increasingly towards the West in terms of, 
you know, like you said, getting military equipment from the U.S. at a discount versus getting it from Russia. I think that was more about the U.S. not being so weird to India. Yeah, we are kind of, we kind of don't treat India as well as other countries. We some, In some ways, we don't even treat India as well as we treat China. I believe we have had people on this podcast complaining about that very situation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's deeply unfair. And besides being unfair, it's also unstrategic if what we want is to have a strong alliance with India. So in that sense, yes, Professor Nalapad is right. We, you know, the US needs to, you know, do some... We need to do some changing. That was very folksy of you. It was very folksy, yes. That's the mustache. Ah, uh, I see. Well, thank you for watching Matt's mustache. I'm Chris Chappell. <laughs> I'm Shelly Chung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Well, stay classy. Okay, I thought you were going to say, and I'm Matt's mustache. <laughs> uh, Anderson, add in a voice that's Matt's mustache saying goodbye. Hi, Matt's mustache here. Thanks for watching. <laughs>